Well, I wasn't too sure what the members wanted to see, so I just uh, decided I would meander through some of the uh, watches that I have in my collection and give you some sense of what I look for and why. Um, way back probably 20 odd years ago, if not more, maybe closer to 30 or even 50, uh, a gentleman by the name of Bill Graham was our uh, president. And uh, through part of the club's marketing, he was interviewed. And I believe it was for the Ottawa Citizen at the time. And one of the things that stuck in my mind was that he told the reporter that collecting is a mild form of insanity. And uh, in some cases, perhaps it's not so mild. And uh, I, I might think that I'm one of the ones that's not so mild, but then I did meet a collector in Toronto at one of the Toronto Invitationals, and he collected only Waltham 18 size model 1892 watches. That's all he collected. And he was at a Mart table and he was selling some, and what it was is he collected uh, private label watches with Basically, they all had the Waltham 1892. Um, and if I was insane, this guy was truly over the edge, but he was a nice fellow nonetheless. If you ever go to some of the local antique shows, um, there's a dealer out there who um, has a company name or a business name, Dead People's Stuff. And uh, quite frankly, um, that is true. What we collect at one time belonged to someone or many someones who are currently dead. But that sort of is what intrigued me because behind each and every one of the watches we collect, there are stories. So when I go through this, I'm going to tell you a bit about the watch and a bit about the story to the extent that I've been able to find out. This, um, believe it or not, was my first watch. Um, I was at a, uh, an Ottawa club meeting, and this goes back again 30 years, and I was looking for a gingerbread clock. And a, uh, a gentleman who's no longer with us, uh, Nate Siegel, is a bit of a picker. Um, he saw me looking at this gingerbread clock that was being sold. It was beautiful for $200. And that was what they cost back then, believe it or not. You can buy them for dirt cheap now. But anyways, so he came over to me and he sort of, lifted his coat jacket and showed me this particular watch. And it was a really nice watch. And opening the movement, I'd never seen anything quite so beautiful. I mean, we're talking an Elgin Veritas 18 size lever set. Um, it has the gold center wheel, gold jewel settings. It's got the cap over the balance, uh, balance wheel there gold micrometric regulator, fabulous. And the serial number dated to 1904. So I was really quite Gary, impressed. Excuse yeah. me. Um, what intrigued me when Nate was showing me this was the, um, the name on the dial, because up until then I wasn't a watch collector. I didn't know about private label watches. And, um, uh, he, he basically told me that Moses Bilski was um, uh, the first person of the Jewish faith to uh, settle in Ottawa. And um, he was quite a character. Uh, prior to settling here and opening a pawn shop, essentially, um, he actually prospected for gold in the Klondike. He um, was a, a mercenary in South America. He uh, ran guns down to Mexico. So he was quite a character. And when he moved to Ottawa, um, he was in love with a 
lady from a prominent Jewish family in New York City. And he claimed he had a, uh, a massive jewelry store in Ottawa. And so the family decided to come up and see it before they'd let their daughter marry this fellow. So he was caught uh, off guard and immediately went to a friend who had a jewelry shop, had the signs changed and pretended that his friend's shop was his. So ultimately he got married to this lady. But he was very involved in the Jewish community and he in fact brought um, Rabbi Mursky up from New York to serve the Jewish community in town. Um, we were fortunate enough to have uh, two of his um, uh, descendants, uh, Anna Bilsky and Millie Mursky, give a presentation to the chapter, oh, probably 10, 15 years ago, about Moses and his shop. This was, uh, Brian had asked about um, whether he was a railroad inspector, and um, he, he actually um, wasn't, to the best of my knowledge, but this was his shop on um, Rideau Street, right across from the, uh, the, the station. So he sold a lot of railway grade watches, which uh, uh, to me was kind of interesting. Look at, look at the horses. Yeah. His sons took, uh, you know, got involved. Well, one of his sons did, um, but he wound up closing in 1923. Uh, they had a big uh, auction to sell off all the goods left in the shop. So what I decided to do then, because my insanity was such that I had a limited amount of money, but I wanted to buy watches. So I decided I would buy watches that had something to do with Ottawa, anything to do with Ottawa. So that included private label watches, presentation watches, advertising pieces, etc. So I thought I would start with some of the private label watches. Most of these, uh, I mean, obviously when you're getting into a collection and I tend to be organized, you go out and you do research and say, well, how many private label watches are there, uh, makers? How many watchmakers are there out there? So I would know approximately how many watches I need to buy. And the only book at the time that, that looked at that was the John Langdon book. And if you go through there and add them up, there's 79 watchmakers listed up to 1900. So I didn't think that this was terribly accurate because it was missing some watchmakers that I actually knew about. So I went to every city directory on Microform and I copied down and typed into a database for every year who was listed as a watchmaker in the city directory and their address. And that's in Ottawa, yes? That's in Ottawa. And what I found was 129 watchmakers listed up to 1900. So Langdon was a good start, but he was missing a lot. And I went on and I was able to sort them. And I also went right up to 1930. And by 1930, um, Watchmakers are not advertising as watchmakers, they're advertising as jewelers. So I had no clue whether they um, had a big business in watches or not. And uh, being on a database, I was able to sort it by the watchmaker so I could show the watchmaker the years he, he was in business and advertising and his address. So what I thought I'd do for the sake of this, I would start with the very first watch on that list by watchmakers, and that was Addison and Boyd, 1898 to 1901. This is a little hunter case watch, uh, no name Swiss uh, watch, 15 jewels, um, probably uh, O size or six size, something in that, that range. Of course, with private label watches, they that name on the dial for advertising. So when you show the watch off to a friend, you'd know where you got it. If you had to do a repair, that was a quick reference where to go back to. Um, my research found that there were a lot more Addisons or a lot of links to Addison. Uh, Charles Addison actually started it in 1877. Uh, his son, uh, 
went into partnership with Thomas Boyd, but that was over by 1901. And then Thomas Boyd carried on on his own uh, for some time. And you'll find a lot of uh, Boyd watches, but very few Addison watches. And I certainly haven't found a Charles Addison watch. But they really did use that for advertising. We all probably remember the Nettleton um, jewelry store. Uh, there is, in fact, there were two in Ottawa because George Nettleton's brother opened a shop. Um, and you can see that on this one, as at a time when George was in partnership with William Haskett, and they were watch inspectors for the Grand Trunk Railway. Um, George was a little more famous and more interesting to me than just the fact that it was a private label watch. Hey, yes, and there's the uh, era for uh, the Nettletons. There's only one shop in town now with the great, the grandsons operating it. But George Nettleton also was a graduate of the Canadian Horological Institute. And this is a picture of his graduation watch, number 27A. So it was the second tier made from an abosh, uh, but still 1912. And then you saw he started up his business in 1915 in, in Ottawa. Do you have that watch, Gary? No, the Nettleton family still has it. And uh, they were kind enough to, uh, to show it to me so that I could uh, uh, take some photographs of it. That's great. Don't often see that level of cooperation. Now, advertising was one thing, but some watchmakers were known and were involved in history in certain ways. And Ben Edelson was certainly one of them. If you're from the Ottawa area, you'll know that Edelson's, the jewelry shop just closed down maybe 10 years ago. And Ben who started it was a man who got himself in trouble. Uh, he in fact committed murder. He uh, slew a fellow watchmaker, Jack Horowitz. It turns out that Jack was uh, having an affair with Ben's wife and um, he heard from Jack's wife that Jack and Ben's wife were going to be meeting clandestinely one evening in the winter. And so um, he found out where they were meeting. He caught up with them. He took a hold of Jack, dragged him back in his car to his shop, took him down to the basement. They got into a struggle and he shot and killed Jack Horowitz. Now this was, in December of 1931, so he clearly missed Christmas. But in January, uh, he actually went on trial and was acquitted. Uh, he went on the stand himself and uh, said it was self-defense. He was struggling with uh, Horowitz, who did not come with a gun, who was there uh, probably trying to get away from a guy with a gun. Um, but in addition to Edelson's own uh, uh, defense, uh, Jack's brother came and uh, uh, said that basically Ben wouldn't have done this on purpose. It, it was all a mistake. So Edelson got out and he carried on business and the family was uh, uh, still there. And in fact, uh, Michael Edelson is a descendant of uh, Ben and a very well-known lawyer in Ottawa. So until The Citizen recently republished this story that was in the original paper, these articles uh, several years ago, uh, we never wanted to include this story in the uh, Bytown Times. <laughs> Francis and James Grant, they were a family and this shop actually was found on uh, Wellington Street, uh, basically across from where you would see the uh, National Library and Archives Canada. And they had their shop up above the store. Uh, it was started initially by Edward Grant, but Francis and James, his sons, took over and operated it from 1874 uh, to 1911. Uh, subsequent to that, uh, James carried on on his own for a brief while. 
And this shows you some of the risks of private label watches. This is a watch. It's the only watch I've ever found from the Grant shops. Um, but it was from the Francis and, and James Grant uh, variant. And notice what happened on the dial. The watchmaker, when he produced these labels, painted the name with a V instead of a W. So it's Ottawa, Ontario. And he actually engraved the Ottawa in the, um, the plate of the watch as well. So I'm not sure what he did with his watches or whether they went and got a new supplier, but they probably never went back to this fellow. Now I'm gonna, I, I could go on and list a whole bunch more watches. I've got far, far too many. If you talk to my wife, uh, uh, private label watches. Um, but um, I'm gonna move on to some of the more interesting watches. And these are presentation timepieces. Now this is a very beautiful watch. It's uh, Gruen and Son. It's uh, in a 14 karat gold case from the uh, Toronto based American watch case company. It's lever set, 19 jewels. Gold on the dial, the minute numbers here around the dial are in gold. On the movement, you can see the cap jewel is bush with gold as are all of the others and the center wheel is gold. Uh, it's, uh, as I said, it's lever set and so on. The date on this is fairly easy to say, even though this watch by the way, it wasn't made by Gruen and Sons. It was made by Julius Assmann in Glashut, Germany for the Gruen company. So who was it presented to? Well, on the inside desk cover, it has the following uh, note, and I've written it out here. Presented to Mayor Francis McDougall at the banquet given his honor at the Russell House by his friends and admirers Wednesday evening, January 30th, 1901. So Francis McDougall was a mayor of Ottawa for just two years, which apparently was fairly common back in that era. He was actually the owner of a hardware store. And when he retired, uh, his plan was to go back to England. Um, and so his friends thought they would give him a send off. Uh, the Russell House was a fairly significant hotel on Spark Street uh, in Ottawa, no longer there. Um, and that's where they held the celebration. The sad thing was that this was just seven days after um, Queen Victoria had passed away, eight days. Here's another presentation watch. Um, it's uh, kind of interesting, uh, 18 size. It's a model 1883 Waltham, uh, the Appleton and Tracy grade. Uh, lever set, and it's uh, circa, I can't see it, but 1800 or 18 something, 18, uh, anyways, you can see it, I can't. Um, again, the case is 14 karat gold uh, made by the American Watch Case Company in Toronto. It does run, but you can see a lot of damage to it. It originally had a micrometric regulator with the patented Waltham star wheel. And the regulator would have been down here, but somewhere along the line, that whole regulated system is gone. The arm has been changed because you would still need the uh, pins, the hairspring pins to be in this place. And since this is all solid, if you move that around there, it wouldn't run properly. I would presume too that the, oops, let's go back, the mainspring barrel, um, would have been nickel plated just as this. So possibly the barrel was replaced. So who was this made out to? On the front cover is the Capitals lacrosse team, world's champions in 1893. Now that's a little bit of a stretch to say world's champions because it was a league uh, playoff and there was only five teams in the league. Um, Ottawa played a five game playoff series with the Montreal Shamrocks. And they won the fifth game 
uh, by one goal. And uh, the fascinating piece was that the fans, now in those days you didn't have jerseys to wear, the fans wore these ribbons on their coats. Now this ribbon I don't have, I do have two, two capital lacrosse club ribbons, but this one shows that they were the champions in 1893. It's now in a collection down in California, unfortunately. Um, getting back to the game, the Montreal fans at the Shamrock Grounds in Montreal were very intense. And as the game was coming to a close, the captain of the, the Ottawa team was running down the uh, side of the field with the ball and a fan stepped out and stuck his foot out and tripped the captain. And that was a signal for the whole crowd to get down on the field and start beating up on the players on the field. Uh, the only reason they were able to escape was the Montreal team surrounded the Ottawa team and led them back to their, uh, to their train. So this watch was presented to James Murphy and you know what it says by the citizens of Ottawa. What happened in that era, the Ottawa Journal, the newspaper at the time, um, had a teletype machine and they were getting the scores from Montreal. And they were announcing outside the building and there was a large crowd there waiting for the scores to come in. So the cheers were just enormous when uh, Ottawa won the last game. So what the journal did is they set up a subscription to get enough money to buy each of the players a gold watch. And this is one of the team members gold watches. Murphy was the one who scored the winning goal in that last game. Now for years, I would tell people about this watch and show it off lovingly, only to find out a couple of years ago that about three years later, Ottawa lost a championship game to a team from Toronto in that same five team league. Now this team from Toronto hadn't won a game all year. Ottawa had won all of their games. So the team and all of the players were sued for throwing the game and taken to court, but ultimately the judge threw the, the, the case out but it sort of put a nice stain on this watch and all of the players at that time. Gary, I can't help but laugh, but where are you finding these stories? Basically, um, newspaper archives. Just going back and reading one issue at a time every day for every year. Oh, it's, yeah. it's a lot of work. <laughs> Here's another presentation watch, and this one is really rather simple. It's a Waltham 7 Jewel Ensign Grade. It's actually in a coin silver case, which is kind of nice, um, but it too is a presentation watch. And if you can read this, it says, Public School Cadets, Ottawa, Musketry, 1906, first prize, Kent Street School, E. Wilkins, 59. Now, the Kent Street School closed decades ago, so there was no records there to be found. E. Wilkins turns out to be a fellow by the name of Edgar Wilkins, who went to the school at the time. And apparently the military put on a review at Rockcliffe Park. And there were all sorts of games, particularly focused on tactics. But they had... Um, uh, gunfire volleying and so on and so forth uh, at this competition. And this apparently was the winner first prize for musketry at this competition. Now I should point out that I learned from discussions with other people in the know that the term musketry was used regardless of the weapons that were actually used to fire. I couldn't imagine in 1906 students muzzle loading muskets to fire at targets. Um, this was, in fact, uh, I'm not sure what kind of gun was used. All the newspapers reports did not mention 
uh, Edgar Wilkins. They did not mention the individual prizes. They did not mention uh, what gun he might have been shooting. But still, it was an interesting watch to find and a presentation piece. Now, here's another one, again, a bit of an odd one. Uh, you'll notice that, uh, by the way, this watch is 18 karat gold case. Uh, you'll notice that it's a Bilski and Son watch. They got a huge chip out of the dial, which is not very nice, but a nice watch. Uh, Cres Crescent Street, 21 jewels, 16 size. Um, just a, a beautiful watch with, again, the, uh, the gold star wheel that was missing on the Murphy watch. And then the gold uh, jewel settings, gold center wheel, um, very, very nice. And this was presented to J.C. McQuaid, the Ottawa Football Club, uh, in recognition of his achievement as a member of the team Interprovincial Champions 1909. Well, from what I've found, J.C. McQuaid played with the Ottawa Football Club but he left town and didn't go to the championship game. Um, they gave him a watch anyways, I guess. Um, the other thing I found is that if you look at all the records for football, the Ottawa Football Club eventually became the Senators and the Rough Riders, the Renegades and so on. Um, but all the records show that even though the Grey Cup was um, put forward for the uh, interprovincial competition in 1909. This team did not win it. The team they played for the interprovincial champions, the Toronto Varsity, won it. And when I look up interprovincial uh, inter champions, I can't find any record of this team winning. So Lord knows if there's another watch out there for a team member or whether dear old J.C. McQuay did this himself. Doubtful, but very vague history. Nice watch though. Now this one, for some reason, my camera decided to make this uh, presentation watch look rose gold. Um, I couldn't fix that with my photo software, but it's actually gold, it's not, it's yellow gold. And it's a 19 joule, 12 size um, Riverside. Uh, again, with the star wheel micrometric regulator runs, well, did run beautifully. The reason I don't have a picture of the actual movement here is that uh, I, I have a broken balance staff and it's in parts on my bench. So I will get back to it and get it restored at some point if not by me, then by some poor worker bee out there. Nice watch. So presentation to whom? Well, this was again, a presentation watch to Cy Denany or Cyril is his full name in recognition of his achievements as a member of the Ottawa hockey team, champions of the world, holders of the O'Brien cup and the Stanley cup, 1922-23. And yes, this was the Senators, the Ottawa Senators. And again, this was a subscription watch pulled up together by, a, a, I believe it was still the journal. And um, does anyone out there know the O'Brien Cup, the difference between the O'Brien Cup and Stanley Cup back then? Ah, the O'Brien Cup was a league cup. It was not the championship cup. Uh, well, it was the championship cup for the league. The Stanley Cup was a, a challenge cup. And the Ottawa team had to travel to Vancouver to beat the Vancouver Maroons, and then travel to Edmonton to beat the Eskimos, which I like to think was why they switched over to football. But that's just my feelings. So who was Cy Denany? Well, Cy Denany was um, a left winger on the Senators. He was league scoring championship for quite a few years. 
he ultimately went down, I believe, to play for the Bruins and played with the Maple Leafs. And this is a team photo of the Stanley Cup winning team of 1923. And there's some individuals that you might recognize. Francis King Clancy. Cy Benedict is down here. I don't have his name in there, but um, uh, Frank Nyber was a, a well-known player. And then Clint Benedict. And the interesting story about Clint, he was the goalie, is he is actually the very first player goalie to wear a mask, uh, not Jacques Plante. Um, Clint wore it for five or six games. I don't recall offhand now. Um, and it, and he got hit in the face with a puck, broke his nose, so he didn't wear the mask afterwards at all. Now, one interesting thing here is, is King Clancy. Of course, he's better known, I believe, with respect to the Toronto Maple Leafs. But Clancy actually started in baseball. And when he got tired of baseball, he actually was the coach of the Ottawa Football so Club for the, for the period of time when supposedly the Ottawa Football Club won the Interprovincial Championship in 1909. And so then he played hockey. He was an all-around sporting blade, I guess you could say. Was there some question out there? No? We're getting close to the end. Now I'm getting into unusual watches. Now, this watch looks like a yeah, basic watch. Uh, Elgin, circa 1888, 18 size, 11 jewels, lever set. Nothing special about it until you see the engraving on the bottom of the plate here. It's, quote, the Ottawa, end quote, number one. Now try to find what the hell the Ottawa number one was. My first thought, well, maybe it was a steam engine. They used to name them back then, but the only steam engine that made it to Ottawa with that name was out of service long before 1888. I thought it could be one of the steamboats that plied up and down the Rideau River. There was none with the name Ottawa. I checked to see if um, if there was a fire engine at one of the firehouses called the Ottawa Number no. One, no luck. So we know that there's a lot of Ottawa's cities, Ottawa named Ottawa in the United States, and I found one that was just a hundred miles from um, the city of Elgin. So I called up their museum, and they said they had no clue, but there was a a uh, crazy city historian who would know everything. So I talked to him. Um, and he answered the phone by saying, God bless George Bush. Anyways, that was during the middle of one of the wars that, you know, over in the Mideast. Anyways, he confirmed that there was no steam locomotive, boat, or anything else that would have had this on it. So I just set this aside and thought, well, I won't think about it much anymore. I did look up, there is a list on the internet of private label watches from Elgin. And there are in fact, three watches, all dating to 1888. Um, two were relatively the same. The first two on that list, the, the red and red is this one here in the pictures. Uh, same grade, same model, same everything. The, um, other one is a little bit, um, little, it was also the same year, but it's a little bit better quality. I think it had 15 jewels, something like that. And whereas the first two were stem set, this other one was lever set. So anyways, after that, I just put it away until one day on eBay, I saw this watch. Again, is it Elgin National Watch Company? Only this one is the Ottawa, and note that this time the Quotes are around Ottawa, not the. Number two, it's a better grade watch, uh, a few more jewels, micrometric regulator, which the others didn't have. Um, but 
still no clue. It's not listed in the um, Elgin database of private label watches. So um, I really don't know. One of the reasons I'm inclined to think this is from our Ottawa is that I found both watches in Canada. So yes, they could have come from the States, but they were both found here in, in Ottawa. Who knows? If anyone out there can find some information on this, I'd be glad to hear it. Again. Here's another odd watch. I think this is the last of the odd watches and then we get into the final watch. Um, this is a jump hour watch. As you can see, it has uh, one hand and um, the hour is showing up here around 12 o'clock. Uh, and so the minute, the hand represents the minutes. Now, who can recognize the gentleman whose image is on the dial? Ah, shame on you. <laughs> that's, that's Wilfred Laurier. Oh, okay. And uh, it's hard to read this. These letters tend to disappear in time. Um, I don't know if they called that photo engraving or how it worked, but it's not a decal, it's not painted, and, but it's on the watch. Um, it um, has a nice Swiss movement under a glass uh, dust cover. Uh, it's got a lever escapement and it appears to have jewels, although I haven't taken it apart to, uh, to see how many jewels and it's pin set. So quite clearly a Swiss, Swiss made watch. So, using the word Laurier and looking at this, which looked like Ock or Rock City, you get close to it, you can see something like the word cigar. So I started doing research and what did I find? The Rock City Cigar Company in Levy, Quebec uh, had a line of uh, cigars um, that uh, they sold for uh, five cents a piece. If you find anything like this box, I don't own this box. I downloaded this picture from uh, the Canadian Museum, shame on me. Um, but you, every probably year and a half, a beat up and battered cigar box shows up with this on it or a tip tray with his picture on it. Um, they all are hugely expensive, hugely expensive. I found this watch for a couple of hundred dollars at the, um, the uh, flea market, uh, oh, down, Michelle, you might know this, it's in Quebec. Hudson. Hudson, yes, thank you. <laughs> Many years ago, there was a fellow by the name of George who uh, hmm. was selling watches all the time. Gary, what's that nine number nine in that window in the dial at the top? That's the hour. It's a jump hour. So every hour that would change. So you have the hour showing up there and this hand, the single hand shows the minutes. So on so the hour. Nine, 933 on the dial then roughly. Basically, yep. Yep. There is a lot of uh, watches like this. I, I don't know. You don't, okay. I, I, I haven't seen many. I mean, as an advertising piece, I don't know. This watch clearly was made in an era, possibly at the cusp of the dollar watch, but this certainly was a better quality watch than a dollar watch with a lever escapement and jewel, but uh, I don't know. I, I don't know who they would have given it to, whether they gave it to uh, to uh, shop owners who sold these watches. Uh, I just don't know at all. Okay, last watch, my prize watch. This is a student watch made by John Kincaid at the Canadian Horological Institute 
in 1890. It's 18 size with 15 jewels, it's stem set. Now, they like to say that everything was made by the student, but of course the springs were not made by the student, the jewels were not made by the student, uh, the hands and the dial were not made by the student. These were all purchased, but every wheel was made, cut and uh, produced by the student. Uh, the balance, uh, the regulator, everything else was made by the student. And how do we know that um, the jewels, for example, were not all bought fresh and inserted in bezels? Well, because many of them were odd sizes. So you would find a wheel with a different size pivot on one end to the other. Um, the watch came in a display case because my sense is that Henry Platner took this around to show it to everybody uh, before he let John take it away. And this is John Kincaid. Um, and we know this was the first watch made at the school because of this full page ad in the trade magazine, The Trader and Canadian Jeweler, which was uh, printed in December of 1890. Um, sadly, Kincaid um, used his training to repair watches. He moved to the States, he repaired watches and used the money to support his family while he went and furthered his education. And he became a medical doctor and a surgeon. And um, for those of you who read the book, um, when he retired, he moved in with his son who had no interest in watches. In fact, his son um, had a mink farm uh, and his son was married, but they had no children. So when um, Kincaid unfortunately died uh, due to smoke from a fire that he started himself by accident, uh, again, the story's in the book, um, the watch wound up in the Rockford Time Museum, where for many years it was attributed to um, the Chicago Horological Institute. However, it was found by Jean Fuller, a, a collector, author, and director of the NAWCC from uh, Sugarland, Sugar Texas. And he and Jane Vercaris wrote the, uh, the article on the CHI in the uh, NEWCC Bulletin. Uh, and he was the one who uh, corrected the, uh, the reference to this particular watch. Now, according to Platner, the watches made by his students were all made to their own design. But in the first year and a bit, he was trying to make sure that the school got known and that they could um, attract more students. So he really rushed the first two students. And there was only two students in the first year, John Kincaid and Adam Ziliaks. So what he did is instead of having them design their own watch, he had already made an oversized watch. This is, it looks the same, but the watch was actually oversized. Um, and he let them use the design for this watch for the first two watches. And you can see the shape of the plate layout. You can see the wolf tooth uh, ratchet wheel. You can see the click. They basically used his design. Um, now, I haven't seen the original oversized watch. They do exist. I found a letter written by uh, Henry Freed, who's well known to those of you who have bought some of his books, uh, uh, master, certified master watchmaker, now deceased. He had actually seen and held Platner's first two watches in hand and thought they were just marvelous masterpieces. So the first three watches, because I'm not showing it here because I don't have it, but uh, even the third watch was done to his design, but to his second, because he made two oversized watches. Now, the thing to recognize is this is not a production watch. So there's going to be a lot of problems with it. And it didn't work when I got it. 
the ballot swung nicely, so I wasn't too worried about that. Uh, so I asked Jonathan Edwards, a member in our club, to look at it and repair it. And we agreed that rather than do a complete restoration, what we would do is take it back so that it was functioning properly and that it looked more or less like it was when um, Kincaid finished it. So there's a lot of things here that you would say, which I'll show you, but we left it because that's the way Kincaid left it. Now, the first thing that, uh, that I noticed was that the click didn't attach to the ratchet wheel. So of course you turn the stem and the ratchet wheel would turn, but it wouldn't hold. Um, and it turned out that was a fairly minor problem that uh, was just a burr on the underside of the click. And we polished that off or Jonathan polished that off. Um, but that was far from the worst of the problems that we found. Um, here was another problem. For some reason, the center wheel is so large that Kincaid had to cut a notch in the balance cock so that the wheel would turn. Um, and it made it very difficult when he was doing some of his fine repairs, it made it very difficult for him to take the balance out to, to repair something on the uh, lever and, and so on, which is where he's having a lot of problems because the balance wheel was so far under the center wheel, you had to take the whole watch apart to get the balance out without destroying the, the hairspring. Now, one thing I didn't mention was that is this problem. When Jonathan took the, tried to take the watch out of the case, the watch was rattling in the case. It, it wasn't held properly, but the case screws were in tight. But what he noticed was that in an average watch, there's three points for holding the watch movement to the case. One would be the stem, and then usually you would find a case screw here and a case screw here. So you had three points, but for some reason, Kincaid put the screw here, right beside the stem. So what some previous hacker had done is they used epoxy to hold the movement in the case. So it took Jonathan a fair bit of time to get the movement out. So he looked at, there was a, a dust ring around the movement, and he saw a bit of a dimple in it. So from his perspective, that was the aha moment. Kincaid realized the problem. So what he did was he put a dimple in so that it would slide into the case itself and hold it as if there was a third screw down in this area here. Fascinating. The interesting thing was that if you look at Zuliax's watch, which again was made to Platner's design, he actually had the case screws here and here, and no case screw here, which is where Zilliax had it. So I thought, okay, Kincaid was pretty stupid, especially if the guy working right beside him had the problem fixed. But remember, Kincaid was the first, and he was following Platner's plan, and guess where Platner put the screws on his oversize. He too was missing the screw at that point. So he did a direct copy and you know, therein lay the problem. Now, Jonathan found a huge, huge number of problems in addition to this, and I'm not gonna go into them, but in the May, uh, 2021 issue of the NAWCC Bulletin, there's a complete story on this watch 
and what Jonathan had to do to get it uh, to get it working. But it runs beautifully, and Jonathan did a lot of adjustments to keep the time uh, to basically match the best of uh, what was being produced as a production watch in that era. This was, and this is basically the second last slide, guys. Um, as I said before, this is not a production watch. He was making this from scratch. And you can see the signs of a one of a kind um, watch. I told you about him leaving the swarf in spots on the case, on the, the plates, I should say. He had another problem. This is the hole where the uh, dial foot would go. Um, it was off center from where the screw was going in. So he was trying to push it back. It never did work. He did these punch marks. So he wound up just using two uh, dial, dial feet on, on the watch. And look at all the layout lines that he put on the watch as he was making it. One of a kind in Jonathan's opinion, still um, a great piece of work by Kincaid, given the speed that he was having to work. Remember, he did this while learning the trade in about six months. So um, quite the accomplishment. And again, my favorite watch. Has to be, I paid the most for it. Well, that's the end. I've got lots more watches, but I'm pretty certain we've run out of time. Any questions? Yes. The balance wheel, you showed some examples and you'll see pocket watches as well. We've got a few in the museum. Why aren't the adjustment screws equally spaced around the balance wheel? They seem to be randomly located in groups and whatever. How, how did the designer and maker decide where to put those adjustment screws? It was basically done at the factory. And it was, um, I'm, I'm not sure how they decided it, um, part of the design. Uh, I know that they had certain screws that they had to adjust by putting washers under to change the weight. Um, but how they come up with the initial uh, layout of the screws, I have no idea. If there's someone who does watches out there and is listening in, please chime in. Uh, Gary, I had one question on your um, on your no. jump hour uh, watch. Was the little pin um, at eleven o'clock? Was that to uh, to bump the hour uh, ahead uh, when you were uh, setting the time? So would it be lever set for the one hand and then um, uh, sort of um, uh, a click set for the uh, for the hour? It, it was a standard Swiss um, a pin set. So the, uh, the minute hand would have to cycle through uh, one time for the hour hand to jump or the hour number to jump. Oh, so you'd have, you'd have to rotate all the way, as per usual, you'd have to rotate yeah. all the way around. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a, another watch that I wish I could have shown you because it truly is unique. And I, I must admit, I only own 50% of it. But it's, a, um, it's being repaired by, once again, my friend Jonathan Edwards, um, who is very kind to me. I, I, I hesitate to ask him to fix anything that's pedestrian because he wouldn't bother. This watch was a um, basically a, an approximately 18 size Ulysse Nardin. And it uh, had two electric contacts on it. So on the case. So I contacted the Swiss museum that Danielle spoke about many, many months ago after his visit. And it turns out that it's one of five watches made by Ulysse Nardin exactly the same. Uh, I believe one went to Cuba, one went to Portugal, and two went to a company by the name of Fabergé. And this is not Fabergé, the enameling company. 
Um, and so I, I did some immediate research on it since there's only five of these. And if you go on the internet and look up Favarger, F-A-V-A-R-G-E-R, it's a chocolate manufacturer in Switzerland. And try as I might, I couldn't imagine any way they would want a watch with electric contacts on such a watch. Um, so I set it aside. And when I decided to ask Jonathan if he would repair it at a healthy cost, um, I did more research. And I stumbled across one single reference to it on one website. There was a company called Favarger that was Swiss-based. And it made master and slave clock systems. And so this company was generally using clocks, but according to a 1906 catalog, this particular uh, watch, um, or not this particular watch, there were in this catalog one page that showed about a half dozen watches that could be used as master watches um, for a, an industry. Not this watch, but it showed that they were using pocket watches for as master watches. Now, I didn't know if this was a master or a slave. So I asked Jonathan when he was looking at it, if in fact he uh, could tell. Uh, he was reluctant to take the plastic cover off the electronics inside the watch, but he did ultimately, and he was able to confirm that this was the controller. Jonathan prefers not to use the words master and slave, but this was the controller, AKA master. Um, he has had a lot of trouble repairing this. One of the jewels was shattered um, and it was a jewel that was turned into the plate. So it wasn't press fit, it wasn't screwed in. He had to uh, lift a, a, a ring of plate around the hole, then he had to find a jewel that was precisely the same diameter with the same hole, pivot hole with the same diameter, put it back in. And so he did that. Jonathan's very talented. Um, and then as he was putting it back together, he realized that the regulator, you know, fast, slow, was not the right one. It had been replaced somewhere along the line. So for the last few weeks, he's been working on trying to make another one. Now, you can imagine he needs new tools, so he's gonna buy some tools. And trying to put pins in to sit as fingers around the hairspring is gonna be incredible and in how you rivet them into the, the regulator. So I'm not bothering him. <laughs> one day it will get fixed, but it'll be a fabulous watch when it's done. For those who don't know, Jonathan Edwards was the first student uh, spent a summer here at the Clock Museum, I don't know, 10 years ago or more. He was uh, a graduate of the Ecole Nationale de Logerie in Trois-Rivières, Quebec. And as a result of his being here, he suggested other students who came as well to uh, sometimes just to as a volunteer and sometimes to do some work to be able to graduate. But um, Jonathan's been to Switzerland many times, and I often joke with visitors to the museum, he can fix your $100,000 watch, Rolex or whatever. So he's extremely skilled, and no wonder Gary's gone to him. And he works, is, is it still Howard Jewelers in Ottawa is where he works? He still works for them. Uh, he's been able to take on these projects for me because during the pandemic, he was working from home. Yes. And they just had one watchmaker, the senior one, in the shop. And they didn't want to have him in there for COVID reasons. So he was looking around for something to do besides yeah, looking so. after his kids. Jonathan's one of the younger people who's extremely skilled on fixing watches. A absolutely. The, the man has got incredible talent. Guess not. Yes. How big is the, the, the watches with electric contact? It's uh, basically like an 18 size watch. You know, you're looking at what, 44 millimeters. The watch looks like a standard, you know, uh, jeweled watch. It just has this little 
thing under the plate uh, with the contacts. And you can see sitting at um, sort of around one or two o'clock, there's two uh, tabs, metal tabs sticking out that they would use to contact, I guess, with the system. Um, fascinating watch. It, and it actually comes in a beautiful wooden case, which is all I have right now. What you did? That um, jump watch you have there at Laurier is a, probably a marketing piece. Um, it looked a bit familiar to me, and I think that it might be a Roskopf. If you check uh, Cooksey Shugart, uh, they've got a picture of the movement that looks a lot like that. Okay, I'll do, I'll do that. There's another interesting story around that watch. I did buy it and paid by check to this fellow at the Hudson Flea Market, and about a year later, I had a phone call from someone who said that um, uh, he wanted to buy the watch. And I said, well, it's not for sale. I wasn't sure how he got my name and phone number, although it was all on the check. So he must have gotten it from the guy I bought it from. Um, and he kept hounding me um, on the phone. And then he, he said, um, well, there's a Laurier Museum in Quebec that had one of these watches and it was stolen by a break-in. So you better sell it to me and then the police won't, uh, won't be after you. So I said, well, I'd appreciate it if you call the police because if it belongs to the museum, I'll give it to them. And that was when I hung up on him. I'm so happy for... Uh, online payments now that you don't leave checks around. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, thank you all. And I appreciate the opportunity to present my collection and I apologize for the massive screw up at the beginning.